Hello, welcome to Think Property Club podcast. My name is Jason John Byron, and I'm going to be your host today on this podcast. We're up to actually podcast number three. And on this podcast today, I'm going to catch up again about my journey into becoming a professional property developer, property investor, property opportunist, what I like to call myself, because that's really what I explain to people what it's all about. First podcast, I kind of said, how did I get into it? And what were the the, the people that kind of introduced me into property? The second podcast, I just talked a bit about the mindset and the three lessons that I learned about how to manage money and and how I would how to start getting smarter with my money by not trying to earn more money, but because that was that wasn't working for me, but to try to learn how people make more money. So what are the things they use to make money instead of me trying to get more jobs or try to re-educate myself into another job? I didn't want to do that. So my journey, as you might have heard before, was that I started filming a property coach and then sat down with her and said to her, okay, look, I've listened to a few things you've you've told me about property um, and my situation is not good financially and I do need your help. And she said that if I was willing to admit that where I was was not a good position and then try to find out, um, like kind of dig down deep into my finances and work out what are the things I needed to achieve uh, and put all, that all on the board, then I, she's welcomed welcome me into her community so that I could come and learn with her. And that was a really great opportunity for me. Because sometimes that life happens, we get like that, we get stuck financially. Is anyone in that situation where, you know, you, you were kind of brought up okay and your parents did okay and you, you know, you never ever had a, a problem, you know, had was able to always get the school uniform and get the books and kind of go to pretty good schools and that type of stuff. But you just never you never felt that the education you'd ha- you'd had after school what you'd put yourself into you know you kind of look back and you went hang on a second you know I've, i thought that maybe i'd be in a different position right now i had never dreamed that i'd be in so much debt and that can happen to a lot of us and it's not really about what we do but it's how we manage our funds or or how we're doing it uh it's look i'm very up for people having a job you know it's 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 an important thing to do but the thing is that most of the time we're not taught how to handle our finances so even if we are in a job whether we like it or not we just don't seem to be able to make that money make money and that was a real lesson to me was that if you have money then we've got to multiply it money's worthless in our pocket it just sits there it doesn't do anything right it's the same if you put it in a bank it doesn't do anything the bank will take your money and lend it out and make money on it but so how do we switch that around so that you can make money on it that money in your pocket should be multiplying. Money does have the magic possibility to be able to multiply. Imagine, you know, a hundred dollars on your desk right now, and then come back in a week or two, and it's a thousand dollars. That is possible. But how do we do it? How do people do those type of things? How do people afford the things in life? How do people get two or three, five, ten houses? And it's not so much about, well, the the thing that they're buying but it's how they're buying it, how they're making money work for them. And that's a really important lesson for everyone to to think about right now. How do you make the money that's not doing enough for you, that's not multiplying? If you've got money that's not multiplying, then there are ways to make it multiply. The easiest way isn't by risking it. That's number one. The easiest way is to work out, well, if you don't have enough money, where can I get money from someone and pay interest back on it because it's what money's meant to do. It's meant to be multiplying for someone else. But how can I also get it to multiply for myself? What is the thing out there that I could be doing to be able to make money? Now, one of the things that we always kind of get onto is Amazon and, you know, think, oh, I'll become an Amazon seller. I'll sell lots of stuff on eBay. I'll, I'll come up with some type of online product that I can be selling. The only problem is that you end up having to sell thousands and millions of them to even get a profit margin happening and you end up spending time. So that's what I liked about property. Imagine if you can have the skills, and this just talks about really going in and getting those skills. You you can find them from people. I teach people those skills so that they can actually see property as a way, as a product that you can buy, do something to and sell, or else buy and turn into a cash machine. But most of the time, we talk property is just about buying a house that you're going to live in and paying it off. That doesn't change your life at all. You'll end up working more and more and more. And that's really not good for us. So out of my education that I had, I started listening and I started listening about interest-only loans, right? Interest-only loans and not going into a bank and asking them for it. 
but going the smart way to a broker and saying to a broker, this is my situation exactly. These are my tax returns. This is how much money I've been earning. This is my debt. These are my bills. This is what I intend to do. This is my life. And then they form a story from that. And then the best thing is they go out to a thousand different banks, a thousand different financial institutions, because right now we don't have four banks lending us money. That, that used to be the 80s when interest rates are 16%. But competition is so much now that the interest rates can't afford to go up because its competitors will come in. I mean, I even lend money to people at a certain rate. I have done that before. So no, that wasn't really possible in the 80s. But right now, it's just happening and it's going to be happening more. So you've got to understand that money is out there. Opportunity has changed. And you can actually source money from many different places. But you're not going to source it going into one person, one bank. It'd be like you never shopped around for anything that you ever bought when you walk into a bank, seriously. And even if they kind of give you this illusion that they'll give you a quarter of a percent off or anything like that, it doesn't help you. Believe me, it doesn't help you in the long run. There's no property investor out there that's been massively successful that's used one bank the whole time. And you'll find that most of them, most of them go to brokers, okay? Most of them go to brokers. Why? Because we'd be stupid not to go to someone that could take our situation and manage it for us and facilitate that task of being able to find us the best deal and the best situation and also not cross collaritize us. That's a good broker. One that doesn't put you into the same bank over and over again that kind of says, look, I'm going to spread you out a little bit. And a good broker is one that comes to you every year and says, can I refinance your loan for you to help you out? Maybe I can get you a better deal. It's not greedy and saying, oh, don't, don't switch banks because I still want to get my trail. They realize if they can help you better that you'll be more successful and they'll still keep their trail from one to the other. And that's how a broker works. That's why you don't pay them because there's a commission built in for them from the bank. And that's just the way finance works all around the world. So my first property, I went to that broker and I said to him, this is my situation. They said, your tax is screwed because you haven't done enough tax returns here. You, need, you haven't done any for two or three years. You need to uh, fix that up first. So he's an accountant. He's going to fix it up for you. Thank you very much. That was nice. When would a bank ever help you out with that? So did that. But in the meantime, I said, well, is there anything we can do? You know, I'm, I am. I do have a job that I've had for a long time now. You know, I've almost been working 20 years. It's not great. You know, I haven't hit over 100K yet, but it's full time in a sense. You know, like I'm, I've never not had this job. And they said, yeah, it's okay, but it's a father son business. But look, look, the main thing that's stopping you, Jason, is your credit cards and your debt. So we're, we're going we're gonna to help you here. We're going to help you here because we'll get you something that will help you going because we realize that you have now got the skills, which is very rare, to be able to use money to make money. So we'll help you get that money. So they did. They helped me get my first loan, which was $89,000. That's it, $89,000. I had about, I don't know, $3,000 that I could access. I could borrow a bit more from different people on a short, short term. So I needed, to, I needed to, for, to get up to $14,000. Now, it was pretty good because I had a partner. So we both went halves, 7,000, 7,000, 14,000. Okay, now let's go buy a property for 90,000. Now, with my training, I didn't just buy any property. We bought a property that could be developed in a way. When I say developed, don't let that scare you, okay? This just means if you want to multiply money, you've got to make something better than what it is at the moment. So you've got to develop something. So we just found an average block out in the country. I think it was 2,000 square meters with one house on it. But it, the house was shoved over to the side and there was a, there's a big block of land next to it. There's even a separation fence where I think they had chickens or something on the other side of the land. Um, now, that was one of 10 because the other ones were house back bang in the middle. And they were actually a lot nicer than the house that we actually bought. But I knew that if I, because of the knowledge that I had, I, I knew that I could subdivide that property, which is put a line through it, and I create one block of land with no house and one block of land with a house. So we did that straight away as soon as we bought that property. The amazing thing was that property rented out for 160 a week. I actually thought it was 130. And I looked back and I went, look, look at the records on RP Data because everything I'm telling you can be tracked back. It's easy to find on RP Data and those type of software programs. 160 a week. 160 a week is what it rented for. It was amazing. Um, and we paid 89000 so we paid our money, our deposit, and then what happened is that the first you know, mortgage repayment comes out of a rent. And I'm saying to my partner, and I'm saying, where is it? Why don't we need to put in more money? Hang on a second, this can't be right. Surely I need to give you money. And I, no, no, Jason, actually the rent is covering the mortgage, an interest-only mortgage. And I went, oh, yeah, okay, I forgot about that. So I never had to put a cent towards that property, so it keeps making us money. 
obviously we had to go down there and fix the property up and we did we split it in two and went to the council drew up a little bit of paperwork and then went to the titles office there's a process to everything it's not the first time this has been done guys and it's the safest way to do it really instead of risking your money somewhere else you can actually see it it's physical land's the best asset you can ever have it's real people will lend you against it you can do stuff to it so what i'm getting down to here is that we we put that line through the property and we created one block with a house and one block with a piece of land that piece of land was worth twenty thousand on its own how do i know because the bank actually told me that because we get a valuation out because what happened is that once we'd separated what we actually bought they wanted to revalue it and it didn't come back any different what i mean is that the land was worth twenty thousand on its own and then the house which we bought for eighty nine thousand, was now on half the block of land but still worth the same and this is when it's great having a broker. And I quizzed them. I said, how is that possible? And they said, well, you're getting pretty good income off that. Is that going to change if you split a block of land off? No, it's not. There's even a fence there to start with. You didn't actually rent out that piece anyway. And so the bank kind of looked at it from that too. They said, well, your asset's actually getting money in. There's a good record of it. For the last 20 years, it's got good rent in. We still value it 89000 Since you've cut that block of land off, we really can't say it's valued any less because the valuer has to be honest. A valuer has to look at that block of land and compare it to other blocks of land. They've got to have an integrity behind it. They've got to be able to prove why they came up with that valuation. And all the other houses on the street and half the block of land were getting the same amount of rent as me. So that was just amazing to me. It was just a more amazing that I made $20,000 in like four weeks. I've never made that amount of money in my life. I didn't even know anyone that had $20,000 cash. And that's what I mean. Like, some people go, oh, but, you know, it's kind of separate off. No, look, I, the, the agent came to me straight away as soon as he heard what I did. I can sell that for you. I could get you good money for that because I know a guy that wants a storage yard to put his stuff on close to the train station. And I didn't sell it because I was like, no, actually, I'm actually going to double up on this. What my whole intention was was to get a relocatable house, which is a house that has been taken from one location, split in two, just put a saw right through the middle of it, and it was put on a block of land at a little place called Gan Main, if you've heard of Gan Main. And there's this big, big like field, this big paddock with all these houses cut in half on it. And so when we got down there, we, we renovated the house a bit. And this meant that we changed the light globes, we painted. Um, what else did we do? Fix some cracks, um, cleaned. Um, I think that was about it. Put some gravel. Gravel's a great way to do driveways, you know that, in the country. You just buy a whole of gravel, put it in a trailer, and then put it on the driveway, and it looks brand new. And most of them really like that. And no weeds really grew as much for them as what it was just raw, so that was good. <laughs> these crazy things, these memories I have. And then we got on the roof, and I started painting the roof from a red roof to a grey roof, and I didn't take a paintbrush down with me, and the only paintbrush I could get was one that was about the size of a toothbrush basically half an inch or something like that so i painted a whole roof with that because i had nothing else to do and i wanted to do it and i'm the type of guy you i want to do something i'm, I'm going to do it i don't care what and so i'll never forget that paint that whole roof and everyone laughs at me when i tell that on stage because they think you're a, you're an idiot why did you paint the roof with that why didn't you just go and get another bigger brush i mean and i said oh, i never paint i didn't i didn't actually think that you could get bigger brushes because that wasn't my life i've never even intended to do it and uh so that was a, I'll never forget that, you know, paint that whole roof. It took me two whole days with this tiny little brush. But hey, it was done and I was learning. And the whole time up on that roof, I'm looking over the city and I'm looking at this block of land. I'm going, mm, what am I going to do with that block of land? What am I going to paint, 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 paint? What am I going to do with a block of land? And then I'm kind of keep visualizing these houses on it. And I'm like, Amy, let's get in the car. Let's go to this. I found this relocatable place we found about 10 of them but one was at game main we went there and we were shocked we go there and there's all these houses on this paddock and we were like wow what's going on here why did this guy get all these houses from he steal them or something what why does he have all these house on his paddock and this guy was just a removal guy so when someone wanted their house didn't want it anymore because they wanted to redevelop their property he'd just take it away for them and pay them for it and then sell it to other people so we found a house they wanted 60 for it and i was like no i don't want to pay 60 i can't afford 60 um and so we negotiated with him we told him our whole plan that we wanted to make money we wanted to develop it and i said look i got a block of land worth twenty thousand dollars here's the deed to it this is the whole thing here i don't know if we can quite come up with all the money but i can put this as security 
And and uh, the bank said, and well, not the bank, but the valuer and the and the brokers actually said to me, if I put this house that you've got here on this block of land and we move it onto there, it's worth at least one hundred and twenty thousand minimum. And I showed him this paperwork and all this type of stuff, and he's like, yeah, okay, all right, I get you. I said, look, I can't, I don't know if I can come up with all the funds, but can we do something here? You know, you got bloody twenty two houses here, and you want to get rid of them, right? So we're gonna do a deal. So we did a deal. In the end, right, the value of what that house would cost me to put in that block of land was 44000 including GST, including GST. And I say that because this is just a thing you do as a property developer. You always GST added in there so people know about it because you're figuring the calculation on it. Anyway, we um, did the deal, put that, prepared the land, obviously, did, did the stumps, put the house on a truck, cut it in half, and it turned up at our block of land. And, oh, geez, the whole neighborhood came out. It's the one thing about being in the country, you know. I don't know if anyone's ever lived in the country, out in the country. Man, it's just, it's nice. Coming from the city and going to the country, that was just nice. The people there are just fantastic. The food was awesome. And it just, it, it's kind of like no one's watching you. Except, well, everyone's kind of watching you, really. But no one's watching you if you're doing it locally, you know what I mean? No one knew what we were doing. Everyone thought we were crazy. Imagine that. Two city kids going to the country, buying something for eighty nine thousand, and then and then going to renovate it and subdivide it. And guess what? It was only ten hours away. What the? And our parents, everyone thought you were bloody crazy, you know. But I knew I wasn't, because I had something that they didn't have, and that was the education to kind of say, hey, you know, and we're going to do this um, because, we, you know, we want to get into it. And we don't, I didn't want to risk things. Isn't that a good idea? I didn't want to risk it. I mean, under 100,000, I can live with that. So we went out there. The funniest thing is I, I borrowed dad's car and it was an old BMW um, four-wheel drive because I wanted a big car. And um, and that well, didn't help. That didn't help at all. So if you are going to do this, don't go out to the country with a four-wheel drive. Um, and it's a BMW because then you go and ask people for prices to come and build a fence or do something or help you and they just give you big prices. So the next week I went and took the old Commodore out. I found an old Commodore and drove that down, Commodore Station Wagon. Um, can't remember where I got that from. But um, better prices. So there's another tip for you. Bigger brush on the roof and um, I'll spray it maybe and then take a better, a, a, a cheaper, cheaper car down. You'll get better prices for tradies down there. Anyway, so we put this house on this block of land and um, something happened to me. Like I was really excited and I was feeling pretty good about myself. And Amy said to me, look, you haven't been spending time with your friends or anything and they want you to go play paintball. And so we did that. We went and played paintball. But the only thing was that I was going down a hill and I was wearing army boots because I had it from, from the old days when I used to do training. And, um, and I twisted my whole leg and I, I shattered all the bones in it. And if anyone's ever had a metal rod in their leg, you'll know why you have to have it. And it's because the leg was not going to heal when it's shattered. It will heal if it's broken, but if it's shattered, it won't. So this is it. We got the house there. It's laid down there on the land, ready to go. They put it back together. They put a bit of plaster around it. So it looked like one house again, but then we have to fix it back up. Okay, It wasn't in good shape from a point of view of things were cracked and it didn't look great inside. We had to do it up. It was vinyl clad. Does anyone know what vinyl clad is? vinyl yeah so it wasn't like metal on the outside or something it was a vinyl clad house and it still looks great today you actually just get a hose and wash it, it looks good anyway so amy drove down not me believe me she can she can only drive about four hours and then she gets tired and you need a break and i was like oh i can do a whole 10 hours in one hit but eventually we did it and i visited visited the dog at gunda guy you know on the tucker box if anyone knows about that this dog is sitting on this tucker box and never left um so i went down and <laughs> it's, it's google it google it the dog on the tucker box at gunda guy right near where we bought our first property out in the country there and we'd stop there good meat pie and then continue on for another hour to where we actually had our first property um and then amy drove down this time because i couldn't walk i couldn't walk i could i could like stretch my the whole seat down and put the feet up and take all these painkills and that, but I couldn't stand up. It was just, it was just impossible. So I was pretty much bedridden up until the point that I could be moved around from place to place and I could roll around in that, but any pressure on that, and I'll just forget it. But, you know, this is a whole thing. People make so many excuses in life and 
you know, I seen a lot of people that are disabled and, and I worked with them before at the spastic center when I was a kid with my mum. And I'm like, I can do it. I can do it. Like, you know, what is it? I mean, oh, this is what I want to do. I'm not going to put in, like, my life off now. I'm, I'm started, you know, tell me to be anywhere and I'll go there. And I've always done that. That's a difference behind successful people and people that aren't at success yet. I don't say not successful. I say aren't at success yet because everyone can be successful. If you just go where you're told, if you just keep making excuses, then you're not going to get there. But if you just go and show up, that's half the reason why you're successful. So we go down there, um, paint cans and and all the stuff to fix the stuff, a ladder, um, paint brushes. Amy got the paint brushes this time, and um, and I really couldn't do much because I looked a bit stupid because I just kind of Amy kind of just put me on the floor, and I kind of just. <laughs> I just kind of crawled everywhere um, in a sense. So uh, I don't know, the vision of it probably sounds silly, but hey, you know, we, 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 were, we were on the ball. We didn't really have time to take off. We kind of just said we're going to do this over the next eight weeks because we need to get the place rented, right? And we're going to start getting cash flow from it unless we get it rented. And we didn't really have that much money at the moment. But anyway, we went and we did that. And I came up with a brilliant idea um, because we needed a fence around this, right? We needed a fence at the front. So I called a, I saw this ad on eBay for a pool fence and it wasn't that far away actually. It was in the next town, um, Griffith, I think it was. I said to the guy, look, if you can deliver it and bring it here, then that'd be great. Um, he said, oh, you might need to help me get it off the truck, you know, if, if I come there because I'm only on my own. I said, you're going to have to get someone to help you get off the truck when you get here. Bring someone with you. He's like, why? I'm like, because I can't walk. I'm not classically disabled i will get better but i can't actually walk mate um i got it for 160 bucks pull fence <laughs> so he came took it off a truck and i hired a local guy to come out and put the fence up and then i said okay amy I'm, i've also ordered this turf and she's like, all this turf rocks up and it's all in one big pile and i'm lying on the on the front porch everyone thought i was a lazy bass and my wife was doing all the work and oh god the looks i got laying on that front with a dog dog too hey looks pretty silly oh so amy's standing on ladders she's i'm six foot six guys that's how tall i am i can reach a roof with a paintbrush no problem put ch change light globes and that amy is not she's half my height and so she was standing on ladders and doing all the painting and i i, I, I was pretty good at it. those little things down the bottom the architraves or whatever you want to call them the skirting board sorry so i could paint them but that's about it um and uh so all the grass rocks up and i said just lay it there and i said mate can you just like put them all in stacks on the ground um and this this guy's looking at me like what's going with this guy so i just explained to him i said look i can roll around i can move i just can't put pressure on this leg and i'll figure it out if you just put them on the ground i'll, I'll roll them down i'll just roll them down they can't be that hard and the guy was pretty busy and he told me this anyway he said look i'd help you mate if i could but i got so many deliveries today and i said mate well there's a will there's a way it's fine so I actually laid all the grass. <laughs> I would not do this again, okay, God. I'm not telling you to do this in a sense because I've figured out much better ways to make money than that, just that, set it, staying at home, which is the next story. But we ra rolled all the grass out on the ground there, front and back, and it was good. It needed grass because it was all just a dust bowl. And um, and then a, a load of gravel turns up, and then they put the gravel there, and I'm just shoveling it with a – just pushing it. I needed help. So we hired a guy in the last day to come and help us. Everyone wanted to help us, but we really didn't have any money to pay people. Everyone thought that you're from the city. You must have money. You just bought a house. You know, you're big developers or something. But um, so we paid this guy, this Aboriginal guy. Man, he was good. His name was Fletcher or something crazy. I have to ask Amy again what his name was, but he is a good guy. Rocked up and just a hard worker. And everyone kind of said, get this guy because he's a hard worker. And I was like, why is everyone like this guy? So this is just a guy that everyone calls the whole time because he could just do anything. And really, this guy just wouldn't stop. He had his bottle of Coke and, and, you know, he'd just put it in the corner and then he'd go and do whatever you asked him to do and funny guy and I don't know, really like him. I wish I had him up here. I should go find him again. Anyway, um, I went in. We did all this stuff together. Um, and he, he didn't mind. He didn't have a go at me or anything like that. That was okay. Amy finished the painting. I think her parents came down one weekend because we only did this on weekends, guy. We still... You know, Amy still had a job during the week. I didn't have a job because it's a bit hard to hold a camera and film, which was my occupation. 
when um when you can't walk and when you're on painkillers you are quite a uh, quite a um, no good to anyone especially not filming it's going to look awful so for a whole year i didn't feel i couldn't impossible so that really affected my wage because i'd only earn more money if i could get out and earn it by actually filming something because that was the extra money that i kind of put on top of my my normal just managing you know cameras and that type of stuff so that was where the big money was and i didn't have it then finish the place and here's the big thing right you need to know this is going to be your tip for today tip number one if you ever do this or you do ever do anything to a house and, it, and it's an empty block of land here it is you ready let me tell you a story first before i get into this tip we finish the place off it looks amazing it's beautifully painted inside, new light globes, got this great kitchen, nice bath, shower. Because it was only 10 years old, this house, it was the newest house in the street. And people would actually, you'd see people like walking up the street in groups to come have a look at it. It was that good. Like people would come up the street to come have a look at it. And, um, and then we'd also added a carport on the side of it because the carport in the country actually gets you more rent. We found out we could put a shed on the back. It would have got us more rent too. So if you're in the country, sheds will get you more rent too. But we no way could we afford that. So this guy came and built us a carport, which was great, um, and gave us some tomatoes from his farm, which was great as well. <laughs> that was nice. They were beautiful. And uh, so that's the way it happened. We all finished off. And uh, I think we were quite proud of ourselves and we're waiting for the revaluation to come through. So totally with all our costs, right, 44000 was what the house would, would owe us. The, the, and it ended up being 77000 We could actually get it done for half the price now these days with the knowledge that you get. But 77000 a block of land that was worth 20000 The revaluation came back from the bank uh, through the broker, not through us, through the broker. And did you know that you can actually get your broker to get different banks if the valuation doesn't come up? A lot of people don't know this, that if you go to your broker and you get a valuation, it doesn't come up enough, you, you sell the broker, order another bank, another val. So, oh, there's Siri talking to me. Okay. Crazy. Um, so, the bank uh, comes out and values the house at, um, it, oh, geez, I'm finding it hard to remember the figures. It was 130,000 or 160,000. Sorry, I can't remember it now. I did write it down somewhere. But basically, our um, 140,000, that was it, 140,000, because it was a range from one price to the other. Um, didn't have a shed, so it would have got more with the shed. 140,000. It cost us 70,000 for all our costs that we'd worked out. And then we got it, we actually couldn't pay everyone straight away. So we got it revalued and got the bank, because remember, that we didn't pay, they didn't own the land. Uh, we own the land, they own the other block of land with us. That was where our mortgage was. We got the bank to refinance us out the 70,000 because it, well, they, were, they knew they were sitting on a $140,000 block of land. And the house is only 10 years old, guys, and it was nice. And now we've got to rent it, right? So there's only one rent real estate agent in town. So he comes up, Barry. Um, great, God, man, what would I have done without Barry? Barry, if you're listening, thank you very much. And, uh, <laughs> Barry um, comes and says, "Yep, um, we can rent it out for you. I think I think we'll I think we're going to do really well out of this, guys. Like, this is a nice house. If I didn't, you know, have a nice house, I'd, I'd be wanting to live here um, because all the other houses were old wooden houses and cracks and that. And this actually had an air conditioner already on it, it like one of those split system air conditioners. Where everyone just had the normal air conditioner that stick in the windows um, because again, it was from Blacktown. Anyone know Blacktown in Sydney? So." Um, you know, it was the best house on the street. And um, and then he gets groups of people through. And we're back in Sydney because, remember, we just drove down on weekends. And we're, we had about 25 groups through today. Uh, any of them signed anything yet? Nah. And then we're like, what the? What's going on? Next week, call him up. You know, what's going on? Yeah, we've had a lot. We've had over 70 groups through so far. And we're like, well, what's going on? Why isn't anyone signing it? He goes, oh, well, there's something, something about the place. We're like, well, what are they saying? What are they saying, Barry? What are they saying? And but, I don't know why this happened. And Barry goes, he goes, look, it's a nice house. It's got a nice kitchen. It doesn't, doesn't, there's no, like, 
air going through it. They're not losing any air like all the other places. So at night, it's quite warm. If you put the heater on in the day, you put the aircon on, it's really nice and cool. You got a carport, you got a beautiful pool fence out the front. Um, the, the grass is nice. It's a big block. Everyone can park all their cars, got the carport. But it's just, it doesn't have one thing. And it wasn't the aerial, because most people say it wasn't the aerial. It had already had the aerial on the roof. So it ain't got a clothesline. It ain't got a clothesline out the back. I reckon if you put a clothesline on the back, and I can get the hardware guy to do it for 160 bucks, that you'd re-read rent it straight away. If you did that, it would rent straight away. And I'm like, Barry, go get the go get the clothesline. Go get it. What are we doing? It's 160 bucks a week rent. Go and get the clothesline. Oh, you you off? Oh yeah, okay. All right, I'll go do that. Yeah, good idea. That's the honest truth, guys. That's how it happened. You put the clothes on there, next day someone rented it. And you know, why didn't we think of this? Because we we were city kids. We had dryers. We I never used a clothesline. I mean, I'm sure our parents did, but we just didn't think about it. This clothesline out the back, like what we just I don't know, we just so concerned about everything else, just forgot about the clothesline. We because I had a dryer in the place, it came with the house, this old dryer was pretty good actually we used to dry in it wash our clothes and then dry it when we went down there because we we're pretty dirty so that was the case <laughs> this thing rents out finally and it's great man like with seventy thousand alone and getting 160 bucks a week rent the other place is going well i think we got up to 175 once like it was really good so we had two houses back in sydney i'm still bed capacitated with the dog with harry he stayed with me the whole time good boy had to do the whole shower thing where um, you had to get all this, like this this plastic seat used to have to go in the shower and I used to have this thing that helped me go in the toilet and that. Man, it sounds like the worst part of my life, like not being able to work, having this, not being able to work, not being able to walk, having my partner go out and earn all the money. Having, if I wanted something, she'd have to go do it for me. She'd have to help me into the car. She, uh, she I would bitch and moan. She'd have to put up with it. Um, and it felt pretty bad as a guy, right? But we were on a mission. Like, we, we were looking towards the future. We didn't think about now and our situation. And she's a great girl and I love her, you know. She she put up with that and a lot of girls wouldn't have. They would have said, well, you know, you're screwed. I'm making all the money. I'm not going to stick around and support you. But she did. And I had great friends and that, you know, I really have. And I'm a, even though I could be in the most amount of pain, I still crack a joke. I'm that type of guy. I don't know where I get it from, but I, I am. Like, I always look at the bright side of things. Uh, and so, and it was nice staying at home watching television, playing PlayStation. That was good. But Amy said to me, hey, let's not stop. I figured out that one of our coaches said that you could do this thing called joint venture deals. And this would mean, this is how it goes. You remember it? I'm like, yeah, I do remember it. Actually... What what happened with that? Well, she said, well, so this is where we've got all these skills, right? We now know how to subdivide. We know how to do relocatable. We now know how to get a valuation. We know how to use the brokers. We know how to do research. We, we've done okay, Jace, from that research. So we've already done a subdivision. We need to find a place that other people will invest with us and it needs to make money like we did that block of land for 20000 So we did we found the place. We did a lot of research. Well, I, I actually had to sit at home with a laptop on my chest because um, it wasn't good sit, sitting up. I'd have to lie down. It was much better. And um, instead of playing PlayStation, gave that away. You know, sorry for all the guys that missed me out on, um, was it Battlefield 2? I, I just had to, that was me gone. I was looking at property now. And I found something and Amy did some research and I did some research and we found this place which is block of land. If it was cut off, would be worth 300000 and the house was five seventy five. So that would mean that if we knocked off this block of land, um, the whole deal was worth five seventy five. There's a few of these, but one of them is five seventy five, and you cut off a land, and the land on its own was worth three hundred. People want to land in this area. Um, a good school, and next to Macca is train station. Mervac had done something across the road, um, and so we we then had this community because we did education, right? Because we were part of an, a, a group that we paid for a course and we'd gone there and sat about and learned about tax and about loans and about interest only and about trust structures to protect our assets and all this type of thing. 
Um, but we're also in that room with 3,000 other people, I think. Well, I don't know. Might have been, might have been less, might have been more. It felt like a lot of people. Um, but in our community, in our group, uh, we end up going to another higher level group because, hey, we'd already made money out of real estate now, um, doing well. And it had about 100 people in it. So we had our first group, which had a lot of people in it. Then we had another group with 100 people in it. And we went to that group and we said, um, Amy, you know, Amy and I, pretty good. We've done something already. Um, I can't walk around, but I'm very good at, I'm a bit of a nerd. I'm good on the computer. I found a deal. And if anyone wants to go in on this deal with us, we can show you all the research. Um, Jason's going to be doing it full time because he doesn't have a job anymore. Um, when he fixes himself, he will, but he can't walk at the moment. But, you know, our research has shown us a lot. And um, since he has so much time, he's found this deal here. Um, and it really wasn't a matter of finding time. And I've, I find him now an hour. Once you get better at it, right? And you, you learn the tricks. And this is what I teach people at Shortcut now today. But we found this deal and um, we put it out to this group of people, 100 people. And it was the strangest thing. And the people know me now, know exactly what happened. They remember the deal coming across the table, 575 and the land's worth 300. And they were like, that sounds interesting. And, and what's a deal, Jace? Well, this is a deal that we buy it with all your money because I don't have the money. And I'll do all the stuff to separate the land so you get into two titles all in your name. But I want a JV agreement done with a lawyer that says that I get half the profits or whatever the increase in the value was. So I said, I reckon there's at least 100, maybe 150, 200,000 increase in value once I subdivide this property for you. Um, so therefore, you know, I'm looking for 50, 60, 70, 80, you know, what, I don't know what it's going to end up being. But I just want half of that. Um, and it's simple. It's easy. I can't really say much more than that. Um, and I had this 22-page document showing everything, all the backup, everything like that. And then we had 10 emails come in from people. 10. 10. Like, well, we thought we'd get one or maybe nothing or some questions. But 10 people saying, I want to do this now. And we were shocked. Could you imagine, like, going to a school and it's your first day, and you want to be friends with everyone, and then, and then ten people come to you and say, "I want to be your best friend." You've got to pick one, because those other people we thought would be pretty angry at us, because it was obviously a good deal. We didn't even know it was good as what it was. And these things I find every day now, but I don't know how it happens. But it was a skill put into determination with the steps and the processes to make sure. Same things that I teach people today is not much different now, but. We picked one person. That was a person that sent us the first email. And they were able to do the deal. And the nine other people, after we picked that person, were really angry. Not angry at us, disappointed. They're like, oh, I wanted that. So we're like, well, next one's yours then, I suppose. I don't know. What are we going to do? First one worked out. And that was the whole thing. Would we pick and choose or would we, would we just pick the first one? So we just thought, well, what's the easiest way to do is pick the first one. So we did. And we did the deal. And, you know, I'll tell you that on the next podcast. <laughs> So uh, hope you've enjoyed this. Hope you've learned some things here. I'm Jason John Byron, JJB, Jason John Byron. Um, I have a club called Think Property Club where I like to introduce people into ways that you can multiply your money through property. That's it. To get multiple income, multiple cash flow, multiple streams of cash flow through property. Think Property Club is a free group. But it is a club. You will have to be thinking about property. It's all about property. It's about helping you get that first step into property. You join the club, you're educated on a few things. I kind of introduce you into a few things. You've got actually a little mobile app with it as well, which is pretty good. And then I teach you a few lessons and I put you into a Facebook group, a club. So no one else is in there but the people in the club. And we start talking about property. And I got all my friends over the years in there and everyone there. So you actually get some pretty good advice, not just people that think they know what they're talking about but people are actually really interested and this club is fully open to the public but you have to be interested in property there has to be some interest for you to to want to be there to learn um you know it's like joining a sport or something you can have some interest in it so that's why i didn't want to just open and there's lots of services and people there and people that do what i do and i don't mind if any real estate agent wants to come or someone has got a product that they could sell you that's fine as long as it's concerned around property that's fine the club is getting bigger and bigger it gets 100 people a week 
100 people a week at least coming in. So you can imagine how big it's going to be by the end of it. But I felt I had to do this to introduce people in. I'm also a coach and mentor, and people know me very, very easy to Google my name, Jason John Byron. You'll see me out there. And I do take people to another level. But Think Property Club was given that introduction first, kind of helping them see how to use money first. How do I use money differently from everyone else to get multiple streams of cash flow through property? How did I change my life? Well, it wasn't just the property thing that changed my life, but it was a way that I was learned to manage money. And that's how I teach people that today as well. So I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Um, if you are listening to this on YouTube or you've listened to it on some podcasting and something, subscribe, press that button and give me a like so I know that you like this information. Or give me a comment back. I, you know, Give me some feedback here. What was the things, because often I'll tell people stuff and they'll go, you know what you just told me there, that changed my whole life. I've actually done exactly that or I did this or I did that. Um, ask me anything you want because this, you know, I live and breathe it. And people say, well, why do you do this if you, you know, why do you, if you're making so much money and doing so well? It's because I love it. I sat down and said, what are the things I love? Well, I love doing property. I love talking to people and educating them and helping them out. Uh, I've got a bit of time these days because I have secured cash flow for life. I have secured enough cash flow so it's quadrupled my wage in what that was. And I don't have to go and earn it. I've actually got property bringing that money in for me. And I want that for everyone out there. So, uh, yeah, subscribe, get your little bell going on, um, on YouTube so you keep getting these ones coming through. Join Think Property Club at thinkpropertyclub.com.au and have a brilliant day, guys. Mm-hmm.